How's it going, Yankee fans? Welcome back to Fireside Yankees with your boys, Alex and Nick. If you're new to the channel, make sure to like and subscribe. As always, if you enjoyed the video, and leave us a five-star review on Apple and Spotify if you are so inclined. We appreciate that very, very much. And today we're doing stock up and stock down. Nick and I have both chose a player whose stock is rising and a player whose stock is falling. But we're excited to kind of dive into it. Two weeks into the season, 12 games in, the Yankees have won all four series, one of only three teams to win all four series. I believe it's the Diamondbacks and the Rays of the other two teams, if I'm not mistaken, but yeah, definitely the Rays interesting. Makes sense. <laughs> the Rays makes sense. I'm not sure if the I'm not sure if it was the Diamondbacks, but it, it could be. Um, anyway, Yankees have been tremendous. They've been, you know, really, really doing some good stuff here. Some individual players, notably Labor Torres and a couple guys we're going to discuss, have really stepped up into big roles and made an impact. And we're excited to see where they continue to go and hopefully maintain the pace they are currently on. But Nick, before we dive into, we'll start with the stock up players. How are you do today, my friend? I'm doing really, really well. I've put out some awesome content the last week or so for Empire Sports Media. So all you that are listening, if you want to read and get a more, you know, not verbatim, if you're, you know, if you're not a, if you're like, not like an audio learner, whatever that is, I can't even think of the word, but you're more of a visual learner. Instead of watching us, you could go read some of the articles we put out. Tons of great Yankee content on Empire Sports Media. Have a fun one on Glaber Torres coming out later today, which was really cool. Learned about some of his stuff that he worked on in the Venezuelan Winter League, as well as the WBC, and how that helped him get right. And we are seeing the dividends pay off tenfold. So I'm excited for this episode, man. I love the last stock up, stock down episode we did. Um, I believe the players I chose for my stock up was Ron Ladon. And then my players I chose for stock down was Luis Severino, players, player, excuse me. Um, so I'm excited to do this one again. I love this episode. I like this little series we've done. So uh, kudos to you for coming up with this one, man. <laughs> Absolutely, man. But let's take a look at the first player here. Um, I'm going to go with Johnny Brito. This is my stock up, right? My stock up player. One of the most exciting guys on this roster right now. Elevating his game. The pitching prowess has been excellent. And he's a rookie, guys. When you look at Johnny Brito, he is a rookie performer. And you're getting an unbelievable amount of value out of a 25-year-old we didn't even know was going to be making an impact just two, three weeks ago. So he had a really good spring. You know, was making those, the, make, kind of making a name for himself. The longevity was always there. They call him a workhorse. He was really a bullpen arm at the, at the minor league level. Had a couple starts under his belt. But he can pitch 70, 80, 90 pitches in a game. And he's pitched 94 pitches last game for the Yankees. He has a 0.90 ERA, which is tremendous over 10 innings. He doesn't strike out a ton of batters, but he generates a lot of ground balls and weak contact. 56% ground ball rate has not given up a homer this year. I'm pretty sure the only pitchers who have given up a homer this year are Domingo Herman and Clark Schmidt, ironically, which is kind of crazy. Um, but then you have an 87.5% left on base rate for Brito, who has seemingly just elevated his entire repertoire and all of his numbers the second he reached Major League Baseball, which is rare. Like, you know, we saw Luis Hill do this a couple years ago. Maybe it was last year, actually actually. Um, looks really good in his first start, but you know couldn't maintain it. Uh, he has really good velocity. His command is sometimes a little bit out there, not, not consistent. Brito, he has good velocity, 95.7 miles per hour on his fastball this year, but he also has tremendous accuracy and location abilities. And you know that breaking yeah. ball is nasty. He is really, really, really good at locating pitches. He generates a lot of swings and misses, but he doesn't get a lot of strikeouts. He just produces a lot of ground balls and weak contact, which is just as good, right? Like, uh, yeah. ultimately, I'd honestly say, um, like, strikeouts are phenomenal, but, you know, you walk a guy, someone gets on base, that 56% ground ball rate plays right into the double play metric. So you can really get a lot of good stuff going with just those ground balls, some easy plays for the infielders to make, um, which is really exciting. He's only allowing a 32% fly ball rate this year, which is really good. So they're not, you know, they're not pulling it much, 38.5% pull rate. You know, they're hitting a lot to center field. You know, they're really just kind of spraying the ball, but not uh, really adequately, not with a lot of power. So that's certainly something to be excited about. Uh, Brito has a really nice repertoire of pitches, too. He's only given up a 27% hard hit rate, only three barrels um, this season. So, you know, you're seeing the quality there. You're seeing how well his pitches are being executed. And, you know, he's continuing to grow and develop and mount this success, compound on the success. What are your early impressions of Brito? And right now, I think he probably wins that fifth starting spot over Herman and Clark Schmidt in the long-term perspective. Oh, absolutely. No, you're 100% right about that, that end point there, that he is the fifth starter as of this moment when Severino and Rodon come back. And I think that it's really important to note that you said he's only given up three barrels, and there's been 26 events that he's, uh, balls that have been put in play, and only three of those have been barrels. 
So the dude is being able to not only navigate around MLB lineups in his first season, but he's being able to mitigate the damage as well. He hasn't given up a run, or maybe he's given up one run in his two starts, but he's been utterly dominant in every facet of the word. His changeup is filthy. He's working in a nice little breaking ball sweeper, and his sinker, like you said, that's averaging roughly 96 miles an hour, has been playing up a ton at the major league level. I think it's interesting that he doesn't really get a ton of swings and misses, but it, like you said, the getting the soft contact and grounders is almost not, I'm not going to say it's more difficult in today's day and age, but when you have guys that are big power arms, the guys that strike out a ton of batters, take Albert Abreu, for example, um, they have a tendency when they miss the zone, they miss it by a good amount. They walk batters, they give up hard hits, they give up home runs. Granted, Abreu has been phenomenal this year, so I'm not going to rag on him at all. But those types of pitchers have a tendency to be a little bit more prone to big hits, long and loud hits as well. But Brito's not one of those guys. He's excelling at keeping the ball on the ground, keeping the ball in the park, and having it so they don't pull the baseball when it's lefties on the, uh, at the dish as well. He's just doing everything right for a rookie. And that's the crazy thing to me. Like, I think that this could be a Jordan Montgomery-esque season for him. Remember when Monty had his rookie year where he pitched to, I think, like a 3-5, 3-6 ERA, pitched like 150 innings. Like, Monty was the man when he came up. And Brito could be that exact reincarnation in a different facet. Monty also worked off that curveball changeup. And what's Brito working off of right now? That slurve changeup. So it's like, it's nice to see he's got the power sinker. I do think it's going to be... It's not going to be like a rude awakening for him, but he will come back down to earth a little bit as the season goes on. I just hope the Yankees are willing to allow him, if he has a dud start, to work back off of it and have another good one following. That's the only worry I have, where it's like he goes out there one day and goes through three innings and gives up five runs. And then they're like, all right, you're not ready. We're optioning you back down. I hope they don't do that. He does have options, which is great for the Yankees because they can kind of work around him for a little bit. And he's not making like any money at all. So it's not hitting their cap at all. I just think that having Brito play the way he's playing right now is a massive, massive benefit for the Yankees. Like, Schmidt is struggling to where he needs to go to the bullpen, probably. And Herman is ass. So, Brito playing well is literally what the team needed. Like, it's not like it's a benefit where it's like, oh, this is great. This is, this is um, I'm trying to think of the word. It's not a commodity. It's a necessity. There we go. Like, if Brito wasn't pitching well, this Yankees rotation would legitimately be Garrett Cole and Nestor Cortez. <laughs> You're not wrong at all. So, you know, when you're looking at uh, what Brito's doing, look, the leash has to have some sort of length to it. What, they've given Clark Schmidt three, four starts now, and he literally has not had a good performance. So if, no. if Brito has a, has a tough performance, there is nothing that should even slightly suggest they shouldn't go to him again. You know, give him a chance. Yeah. If he puts three great performances together and one if he won – I mean, that's like what most starting aces go through. Yeah. Three really good ones and then one iffy one. Then they get back to being really good. You know, if, if you can get that type of consistency from him, you're walking away with an absolute freaking steal. I mean, Nestor Cortez, look at his his pathway to the MLB. I mean, he's been bouncing around to yep. Seattle's with this team. That team comes back to the Yankees. The and Orioles. suddenly he finds the Orioles. He, now he finds himself last year, best season by far, not even close. But then he, this year looks great. He's, now he's solidified himself as a legitimate starting pitcher. And you know what? Sometimes it just all clicks. Sometimes it just takes time. This could be like a, a wonder for Brito. He's having, having a couple of really good starts today. Minnesota, pretty good team. They have the same record as the Yankees. We'll see if they can uh, you know, take advantage of Brito. But if I, I hope to God they don't. We want Brito to be a, a phenomenal pitcher for a very long time and hopefully lock down a starting spot uh, for the foreseeable future and, and give us a little bit of youth and a very cheap starting pitcher for the future yeah um you know for at his price point say less that's a really 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 good scenario to be in but you know tell me about your 100%. your stock up guy i'm curious to hear wh who you have in mind so for my stock up guy it's I, I will say it's a little bit it's it's tough to do this where it's like he just recently got injured in a way like it's my stock up guy is dj lemayhew uh le elevate the baseball la home run la mvp la machine la whatever you want to call him fuck it um, he's just been dominant to start this season. And I know he has that little, um, I want to say it's like, what was it? It's like quadricep tightness, I believe it was. Yeah, it was quadricep tightness that he missed the game yesterday, but he was on the bench and he was in uniform. It looked like DJ could possibly play if the Yankees really needed him to. So I wouldn't be shocked if when, by the time this episode comes out, the lineup has come out and DJ LeMay, he was batting lead off for the Yankees. So DJ has been amazing and having him play well is the biggest key to this Yankees team. Last year in the postseason, you saw how much we missed a guy like DJ LeMahieu, and at the time, Andrew Benintendi as well. But DJ's approach to the 
to when he's at the plate is so different than everyone else in the lineup that it helps spread out the lineup. And when DJ bats leadoff ahead of Judge, they can't they can pitch around DJ if they want. Go for it, sure. But then you got to face Aaron Judge. And if they want to attack DJ, that's great. He'll just get on base, and then Aaron Judge is up to bat. DJ LeMahieu this season is currently posting a 130 WRC plus and an 833 OPS. The guy is just a machine. That's why the nickname Le Machine sticks so well. He's also being able to walk a lot, walking 10% of the time. The strikeout rate is very high right now, but I think it's just because DJ is being a bit more aggressive at the dish. I do not think a 31% strikeout rate for a guy that's career strikeout rate is 14% will maintain. But if he does strike out a little bit more like in the 20s, but that means he hits 18, 20 bombs and 25, 30 doubles this season, I will gladly take that. The biggest, the biggest ability for DJ is his availability. So hopefully that quadriceps injury isn't something that's a problem, but he's just been doing everything right for this team. He's got a triple. He's got a couple of doubles. I believe he's got, he's got four doubles. He's got a home run. He's doing, and he's walking a ton. Like DJ just, when he's playing and he's playing well and healthy, of course, this lineup is completely different than what it is when he's not in the lineup. Like we saw that yesterday. Granted, Volpe in his first game as the leadoff hitter hit a scorching double off the wall. And he's been putting Barrel to the ball more. He's starting to find his footing. I know some of the results aren't going his way, but he is starting to get more comfortable. And that's all you want to see out of a 21-year-old rookie who played like a month at AAA. So DJ, what he brings to this team is variety and diversity. It's nice to see a guy that has that approach at the plate where he's not swinging and missing at tons of pitches. He spits at pitches an inch off the plate, just like Aaron Hicks. Except unlike Aaron Hicks, the pitches that are over the plate, he can belt for doubles, for gap shots, for home runs. He knows situational hitting. He's an extremely good opposite way hitter. When there's the guy on third or second, there's the shift on or the infield's in, he can put it through the gap and the hole in the infield. It's just so valuable to have someone like that. And DJ's been getting a lot of hate recently because of his injuries in the past couple of seasons and because of the fact that the Yankees, I believe, are paying him like $15 million this year and he's 34. 34 years old and he's still doing what he's doing. Josh Donaldson's 37 and he can't do shit. So I think, it's, I think it just speaks a testament to DJ's ability to continue to do what he does well, to progress through the motions as he gets older and realizes what his body can and cannot do. And he's still a superb defender. He's already, I think, got two outs above average and two defensive runs saved at third base in like 45, 41 innings over there. So he's on pace to do exactly what he did last year defensively with that 130, 135 WRC plus we saw before the toe injury. So DJ, kudos to you, my man. I, I would tip my hat if I didn't have my, uh, if I didn't have my headset on. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, look, DJ LeMay is one of our most important players. Having him healthy is as essential a variable as you can possibly find on this team. Um, with that being said, you know, he's going to go through some injury woes. You see the groin inj- or yeah. rather the quad injury, and, you know, that's why you have guys like Oswaldo Cabrera to step in and fill shortstop, third base, second, but whatever it might be. Glaber Torres also did that. played an amazing third base yesterday. He had one error, that one but snag, he didn't have that sick Yeah, yeah, that yeah sick but that, snag. the snag against that Marinaccio nasty. inning. If, yeah, if that got that through, big. Ron Ladon probably would have had to be pulled. And now we're looking at a fifth inning nightmare right after Clark Schmidt only went four innings. Instead, IKF saved the day. Then Ron Ladon struck out baby boy Naylor and the stud Andres Jimenez back to back and got out of it. So kudos to IKF. But I think we can both agree. IKF's a great backup third baseman. DJ LeMahieu is an elite third baseman, top 10 in baseball, top eight in baseball. Yeah, paired with his bat, certainly. I think, you know, he's definitely trending up because of the injury woes that were previously um, present. And now we can kind of put those to bed and say, all right, the toe injuries in the past. Like, this quad thing, just a little tight, you know, playing a couple games. It happens is what it is. Um, you know, he'll work through it. And he'll be fine. But as long as that toe injury isn't being really aggravated, we can feel confident about the way the Yankees are going and, and the way he's progressing and just continuously getting better. Strikeout rate's pretty high right now, but that'll lower. He, he's just trying to get into the swing of things. They've been moving, moving him around a lot. Um, so hopefully, you know, he'll, he'll take over things and it'll be fine. Yeah, you know, he's one of our third, players, second, first DH. <laughs> the dude's played yeah, every no, he's, position he played last year in like 10 games. <laughs> Yeah, he's been all over the place. And, um, you know, Anthony Rizzo's been pretty freaking good for us, by the way. People are not talking about how well he's played the last couple of uh, 
games. I mean, just to start the season, his numbers are pretty incredible. But let's take a let's take a look at the stock down players here. Um, two big ones in, in mind. Mine is Josh Donaldson, mainly because this injury has allowed us to see what life is like without him. And life without Josh Donaldson is a lot better. You know, like you have, as you said, <laughs> DJ LeMahieu at third base, at an elite defensive player, a great bat. Josh Donaldson's a walking strikeout at this point in his career. Is he good defensively? Sure. But we have three guys who can play third base at a high level, Oswaldo, IKF, and DJ. You don't need Josh Donaldson. Franchi Gordero's been batting fifth in his spot, and he's been excellent. Gleyber Torres batting fifth in his spot, excellent. You know, you don't need Josh Donaldson batting fifth. You don't need him defensively. Life without him has just as we imagined. It looks freaking great. All sunny and all beaches. Mm-hmm. Even uh, even Willie Calhoun bat fifth, and he's got a double and an RBI. He got an RBI double, and then he got an RBI single batting fifth yesterday when the bases were loaded, or two days ago when the bases were loaded in the Yankees' route. So everyone that's been batting fifth instead of Donaldson seems to be finding some sort of success there, except for Donaldson. So it's like, well, this is this is a bit odd. I mean, maybe it's just a mental thing with him. I I wanted to hold out hope for JD. I thought he could bounce back. The swing changes and the mechanics he changed with his stance and like precursor to actually swinging the bat looked great in spring. But as we can tell, not everything that happens in spring carries over to the regular season. He is struggle ugly. And I don't know what to do with DJ uh, with uh, Donaldson when he comes back. Because it's going to present a bit of a problem for the Yankees roster construction when both he and Bader come back. And now you're like, well, okay, I know Willie Calhoun's going to be one guy that gets sent down. I sucks because I love Willie Calhoun and he's, and he's a great hitter, but he doesn't play defense and he's an outfielder. And we already have numerous outfielders. So now it just leaves a spot where it's like we got one spot left for Bader and Donaldson coming back. Who's going to be the other guy? And it sucks because I think it may be someone that doesn't deserve to get sent down or someone that doesn't deserve to get cut because Donaldson's making so much money. And if he was, if Donaldson was making $4 million this year, I wouldn't give a rat's ass about how bad he's been because he's only making $4 million. The problem is, is that he's making like, what, I think $22 million and then the $7 or $8 million guaranteed. So he's making like $28, $29 million to not only not stay healthy, but to also not play well when he's playing. And I know JD's like probably a great dude off the field and I'm not going to rag on him as a human being, but come on, man. Like, how is it that at this point in your career, you have kind of just pigeonholed yourself so much to the point where you're not only a liability in the lineup, but your team would actively prefer putting someone else out there instead of you, but they can't because you're making so much money. So granted, it's more on Cashman for bringing him in and him having that contract than it is Donaldson. I mean, I'm never going to fault a dude for getting his bag, but also it's like you should realize, hey, maybe I shouldn't be playing every day. Maybe I shouldn't be starting in this team. Maybe I shouldn't say, oh yeah, I will retire when I feel like I'm ready to retire. And that's not right now. And it's like, well, Josh, if it's not right now, you're going to go out quite sad this season. And that, I don't want to see that because JD was for a while there, the second best player in baseball behind Mike Trout. Like I think it was from 2013 to 2018 or 2017. Josh Donaldson had the second most F war in all of baseball behind Mike Trout. Like this dude was a former MVP. He was an absolute all-star, a dominant player. And now we're just seeing him kind of sputter out. And it sucks to see. And what's crazy is, like you said, his defense is still elite, but his offense has fallen off a cliff. And normally when you see guys that are up there in age that play the corner infield spots, especially like shortstops, not the corner infield, but shortstop as well, it's like, okay, your defense kind of goes by the side, by the wayside when you get older, and you become a guy that focuses more on his swing, tries to string some things together, hope you can get a job as a DH. In what world would anyone want to put Josh Donaldson as their DH? <laughs> so it sucks for him that his stock's down. Not this one. Plummeting. Yeah, I mean, his stock's been plummeting. This is nothing new. This is just the reality. Injury has exposed him even further because you see the yeah. supplements are more than capable of picking up the slack and producing more offensively. So that's kind of where he's I, got a I lay now. He's WRC plus to start the yeah, season. Yeah, I mean, he's that's freaking, 28. He's, look, I don't hate the guy as a person. I mean, like, he's done some really stupid shit in the yeah, past. Yeah, he's done some yes, stupid shit like, on the field. But off the look, field, he seems like a, a great guy. Dude. He's probably a fine guy. But reality is this is a, this is a baseball decision. This is a performance yep. opinion. This is, a you know, critical of his performance. And he just is not good anymore. And I think that's objectively true. Yeah, no, 100% true. I absolutely agree with you. I think that's a good pick for stock down. And again, these change weekly for everyone listening. So for all we know, Josh Donaldson can come back off the IL and bat like 500 and the next stock up, stock down episode, we have Josh Donaldson as the stock up. 
That's what I love about this series, is that it's not just set in stone. You can impress us enough to get your stock rising. And the fans. Fans love to see players prove them wrong. At the end of the day, when we talk shit on someone, we want them to make us eat our words. Josh Donaldson, take this as a challenge, my friend. Um, but for my stock down player, it's, again, once again, easy pickings. Um, everyone on the channel that follows us knows I'm not a big fan of this player off the field. But on the field, I hate him even more. Actually, I take that back. I hate him more off the field. He's a terrible person. Domingo Herman. What more do we need to see from Domingo Herman to realize he is not a major league starting pitcher anymore? Not for us, at least. Sure, throw him to the Wolves. Let the Rockies pick him up. He could probably be better than, like, Jose Urania. I don't know. But at this point, he's not good. He's thrown 7.2 innings in two starts. Last game went three innings because he walked five guys and didn't strike a batter out. He has no stuff. His changeup is his best pitch, and his curveball is right behind it. And neither one of them get tons of swings and misses. I know the first game he had eight strikeouts. I understand that. But if you go back and look at it, that was probably the best Domingo's fastball or curveball and changeup have ever looked. And it was against the Phillies team that at the time was, I believe, 0-5. So it's not like he's like slicing up elite lineups left and right. He's just going out there and throwing stuff. And when he doesn't have it, he doesn't care. Like, the fastball is not a good pitch. It's terrible. So, in his last start, he tried to throw the sinker more. But, since he doesn't have good control or location, he couldn't locate that in the strike zone to save his life, so he walked five guys in three innings. He had, like, 80 pitches in three innings. He couldn't get an out in the fourth, and if not for Colton Brewer, yeah, they've come to snuff the Brewster. I love that. We wouldn't have probably gotten out of that game in the way we did. So, it's like, look, I, I know Domingo's had his off-field issues, and this is not a, a testament to that. This is about his on-field performances, and they have been dog shit to start this season. And one, like we talked about at the beginning of the episode, when Rodon and Severino come back, he's got to be the odd man out. Because Schmidt's stuff will most definitely play better in the bullpen, that's for sure. The biggest issue for Schmidt is that he gasses himself because he realizes, I can't go that hard because I have to throw four, five, six innings, and he can never do it because he's made to be a bullpen arm. Domingo, he can't even like throw well for like two innings. It's like always such a laboring time when he's on the mound. That's the biggest thing for me. I know his first game, he wasn't that terrible. He gave up a couple of runs. He gave up, I think, four runs, and two of them were his fault because Michael King gave across the other two on some base knocks. But the two runs he did give up were absolute moonshot home runs off of fastballs that were like dead center of the plate. It's like, I could probably, actually, I, I probably couldn't hit that. But, like, there are so many hitters in baseball that can hit a 92-mile-an-hour fastball down the pipe. So, I don't know. I'm just, I'm at my wit's end with Domingo. I don't know what more the team needs to see from him to realize he isn't good. He's got a negative F war right now, which is awesome. He's got a 6.7 FIP, which is awesome. And a 5.9 ERA, which, guess what, is awesome. So, I just think that Domingo needs to go. <laughs> Domingo needs to go. Uh, Agent Zero, I am done with you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, look, Johnny Brito is going to take his spot at the end of the day. And, and look, Herman's probably gone after this. It's, look, it's fine to have him on the team this year. It's just a supplementary piece, just as a last resort. But he just in has the no future, options now. So it's like they got a yeah, DFA right. and, and see next if he year he's waivers. gone. He's gone next year. That's the truth. The truth yeah. is simple. He is a free agent next year. Or do they? Maybe he has another year of control. Do they have another year um, of control over him? I think they no, do. No, he's a free agent at the end. Oh, yeah, he's got another year of control. Yeah, he's got two so more they have another year of control. control. Maybe two they just years, trade Alex. him. Maybe they, maybe they trade more. him. If we have to see two you know? more years of Domingo Herman, I not. will be ripping my hair out. He's a serviceable starter on a, <laughs> on a worse team. That's the truth. He's a serviceable starter on a, on a worse team, yeah. and you could get value out of him. You could find, like, a good bullpen arm in exchange for Herman, and I would probably pull the trigger pretty yeah. fast and he that. doesn't he wasn't ass last year he was serviceable last year in 72 innings he pitched to a 3-4 ERA 3-6 ERA he was serviceable but he was also getting a little bit he was walking less guys and he wasn't giving up home runs every other batter he's got a 29 percent home run to fly ball percentage this year and for reference Clark Schmidt who I was kind who I wrote a piece on earlier about how he needs to be put in the bullpen has a very unflattering 21.4 percent home run to fly ball rate and he's getting shelled like there's no tomorrow from fans Yet Domingo has seemingly just fallen through the cracks. Like people are like, I guess maybe it's just they've kind of already become accustomed to it and expected it. So they're not surprised. Whereas Clark Schmidt had this hype up. I mean, our own Ryan Garcia is a big Clark Schmidt guy. He had the new cutter. But Domingo's stuff looked really solid in spring. Like I was like legitimately sitting there like, am I going to have to eat my words on Domingo Herman? 
And then two games into the season, I'm like, ah, he's back. No worries. <laughs> so Domingo, stock down. You know what? Stock was never up in the first place. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, you, you make a good point there. But guys, always happy to hear perspectives below in the YouTube comments. Who are your stock up and stock down players over the first two weeks of the season? Always happy to hear uh, your opinions on the matter. Make sure to like and subscribe as always and leave a five-star review on Spotify and Apple. We appreciate that very much if you enjoyed the episode. As always, have a fantastic rest of your day. Uh, good luck to the Yankees later. We got Burrito, Burrito on the mound. We're excited about him. Hopefully he comes together with another really good performance. Um, I think he can do it against the Minnesota Twins who are off to a hot start as well. But as I said before, like, subscribe. I'll catch you guys on on the next Fireside Yankees episode.